in the morning on the 16th of December, which is a Sunday, as I recall, uh, the heavy attack began. It was a quiet sector. We were told at the beginning, you guys are new, you're green, and we think the crowds are give, going to be giving up pretty soon. So everybody kind of laid back and relaxed, you might say. But all of a sudden, we were engulfed in combat. what was next, because you can't control anything. You may think what I've gone through, you could not do. But I think that you will find that, when, that you will be able to find strength that you don't know you have when you're faced with this kind of serious life-threatening situation. You will be able to rise to the occasion that before you say, I can never do that. I can never do that. Mr. Lockhart, I could not go through what you did. Yes, I say, yes, you will be able, to, would be able to go through it because you will find inner strength that you didn't know you had. Yes, I was working uh, as a soda jerk. And when I came into the shop to talk to the other guys who were working, as a soda jerk in there. They told me about this bombing that they had heard on the radio. The Japan had, had uh, bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, obviously that's pretty significant. One year to the day after Pearl Harbor Day, I enlisted in the Army. I had volunteered for the Army. I wanted to be a participant. I didn't know how I would, what would happen to me because that was out of my hands, you might say. They sent me off to uh, Virginia, and that's uh, where I did basic training, and I was a part of the Army uh, from that point on. My attitude was be accepting and adjusting to whatever was the daily requirements. And sometimes it was a pain in the ass, and sometimes it was boring, Sometimes it was interesting uh, and insightful. When somebody said, when you're volunteer, you can't complain. So I volunteered, so I couldn't complain. <clears throat> and uh, that was part of the drama of it all. So I became a re infantry replacement uh, in, with, with the 106th Division that was in training. Then all of a sudden we got the order, we are leaving camp, get in the train, get your stuff, we're off. And so the train took us to New York City and we got off and it was taken to the docks. We were told to get on board the ship, which we all did. And uh, it, was, it turned out to be the Queen Elizabeth, the largest ship afloat. It took about a week to get there. So, but it was very crowded on the ship. You had to stand in line for everything, going to the toilet, getting a shower, sleeping, eating, and then you only get two meals a day, and there were British meals that weren't very appetizing. So we were happy to get off the, the ship, I guess. Now we're in Belgium, and we're getting closer to combat. We were told this over and over again. We think the Germans, they were not called Germans, they're called Krauts. The Krauts will surrender in December before Christmas. Pretty soon they had us believing we're here, but they're not, we're going to see any action. Normally we'd be winterizing your boots, but we don't think that's necessary because we think you'll be out of here relatively soon. So everybody kind of laid back and relaxed, you might say cannon fire of German 88s. Shelling kind of starts coming in. And uh, men around me were getting hit, calling for the medic, calling for their mother. The mother was not gonna come, but the medic will maybe come. 
there's German soldiers uh, out and among us. And everybody was caught by surprise. And I didn't know quite where we were going or I was going, where I was just following orders. The, the regiment that I was in was got completely surrounded by German forces. Of course, a lot of it we didn't find out until months later. That this was the opening day of the Battle of the Bulge. After a few days, apparently, the commander of the two regiments decided they were surrounded and they were not going to get any more ammunition or food, and so they surrendered it. We all thought it was a big mistake. I still think it was a big mistake. And so we, they were marched us on, destroy your weapons, and we were marched down and uh, were taken on a long winter hike into Germany. And they had to sleep out in open, open snow-covered fields and uh, not get fed. And they packed us on train, boxcars. You could not all sit down at the same time. You had to take turns sitting and standing for four days and four nights. Uh, no food, no toilet facility. In some part of the trip, we got bombed by our own Air Force. Uh, fortunately, it didn't, the boxcar I was in did not get hit, but some boxcars were hit. After a few days, got off the train, and according to the train station, we were in a place called Bad Orb, Germany. I do remember it was still snow getting off the train, so we hadn't had anything, anything liquid, so we were all thirsty, so we could eat some snow and get some liquid. Uh, I, I would suppose we hiked another hour or so into this place where the prison camp was, Stalag 9B. I didn't know what to think. I, it was so far out of my comprehension. I, it's about the last thing I expected. I expected maybe to get wounded, but I never expected to become a prisoner. officer speaking to us and he wanted to know of the prisoners who are the Jews and I thought I hope you know better than to identify yourself but some of them raised their hand but I looked at him kind of funny you know you were told a long time ago the only thing you tell the enemy is name rank and serial number you ever become a prisoner so these Jewish GIs had an out if they wanted to. The only thing I can figure out is that they thought that their uniform would protect them. The American prisoners who indicated that they were Jewish were separated from the rest of us. They also took some non-Jews. They took about 350 of them. It was unfortunate, and like I say, some of them were separated right off the bat and sent to this camp in Berga, which is on the other side of Germany. And they were put in a work situation where they doing, were doing mining work, dangerous stuff. 9B, we had people who died every day, but my guess is um, not to the extent that the prisoners who were sent to Berga. I realized they couldn't do anything about it, so endure it, put up with it, and hope you uh, survive. I made it my policy is not lay in my cot all day and all night, is I deliberately walk every day. You keep certain muscles, I guess, working. You only got, you got a piece of bread one part of the day, and in the other part, you got grass soup. Grass soup is not very nourishing, but nourishing, but uh, we were all grateful to have it. Starvation was part of the strategy. 
because that weakened just, of course. Food became the single most, what, what am I say, occupied your mind continuously. I turned 21 in POW Camp Stalag 9B. There was no cake, by the way. No, no nothing. <laughs> Grass soup. <laughs> Grass soup on my birthday. I remember all the subsequent birthdays since that time. They've all been an improvement. All the stoves were fed by wood, not by coal. And so we asked for volunteers to go out on a wood cutting detail. You will receive extra ration. I volunteered. We don't have any winter clothing, but we're out in this woods here, but out of the camp, and there's still snow on the ground. Some of them don't have gloves. We're cold, we're weak. We're not working very hard at all. So one of the guards didn't want to get into a discussion with him. So he takes one of the limbs that we had just cut down and starts swinging him. Dick Lockhart was his first victim, but he hit me in the back a couple of times. And then he took on two other prisoners, hit, beating them as well. After the war was over, after the, or the liberation, they were interviewed, these sergeants, and they were asked, do you know anything about beatings that took place? Oh, and they said, oh yes, we know about the beating, Stalag 9B. They went into it and they, and they named P.F.C. Laka, was one of those who had been beaten. I'm a strong person, basically. I'm not a weakling. I never had any doubt that I would survive. That never entered my mind. I was going to outlast the bastards, no matter what. And I did, so... I knew the arm, the world would, or the war in Europe would end soon, yes. I could sense that. And we were watching the calendar, shall we say. We knew we could hear cannon fire, so we knew the Americans were coming in the right direction, shall we say. Our concern was that the Germans would march us out of the camp before we were liberated. I want to say April 2nd was the official liberation day. Uh, the German guards left. And so that was a tip off that the Americans were to arrive any minute. So we just stayed put, basically and uh, hoped that the Americans would find their way to the camp up on the side of the mountain. I was glad to get rid of the place, yes. Very glad to get rid of the place. Uh, I was, I walked all over it so I knew. You just, un, the uncertainty of life and, and decision making, what, you never knew what was next. You don't get choices, shall we say. So you have to be strong enough to deal with it as best you can. Uh, I tried to learn from it and to be strong and to be helpful to people and not to be judgmental either as much as I could, not to be judgmental because people have different levels of strength and weaknesses. You realize that there are people who were strong and did the right thing and helped others and did not become destructive and hateful. And we have evidence of that those good things prevailing. Do not let yourself become weak and manipulated by others, if at all possible. Stand up for what you think is right and don't give up.